The United States threatens Britain and France over their military support of Israel. Could you imagine reading a headline like this today? And yet that's exactly what happened in the least known of Israel's wars, the Sinai Campaign of 1956. Why has this brief military engagement, with fighting lasting no more than a week and a half, been called Israel's second war of independence? How did it transform the new state of Israel into a major player on the international scene? And how did it shape the careers of a future Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, and one of Israel's most famous military leaders, General Moshe Dayan? First of all, a little background. Following World War I, the League of Nations, that's the predecessor to the United Nations, gave Britain and France authority over certain territories in the Middle East which they deemed not fully capable of self-governance. France was entrusted with the mandate of Syria and Lebanon, and the British were given a mandate for Iraq and Palestine. It is important to realize that in each case, the borders of these mandate territories were determined by the European powers. The United States objected to this mandate system, arguing that it was really just a way for the victorious European countries to rearrange the world to suit their own interests, using international law to give their scheme the appearance of legitimacy. In 1921, the British lopped off half of Palestine on the eastern bank of the Jordan River and turned it into the Kingdom of Transjordan. Later, in 1932, Iraq attained independence as well, but the other regions only achieved self-rule after World War II. But even after their achieving independence, the former colonial powers who had governed the mandates retained significant economic and political influence there. This was the situation in the 1950s when the secular nationalist movement known as Pan-Arabism took root in the Arab world. Pan-Arabism sought to unite the Arabs in the region against the former colonial powers, Britain and France. The central idea of Pan-Arabism is that the Arabic speakers in the land stretching from North Africa to the Persian Gulf constitute one people with a shared national consciousness. But if all Arabs are really just one cohesive group, then they only need one leader. And that's the gap that Gamal Abdel Nasser sought to fill. Nasser came to power in Egypt in 1952, when he led a coup that overthrew the monarchy of King Farouk. Nasser saw King Farouk as a British puppet, a leftover from the colonial era. Now in power, Nasser became the first leader in the Arab world to make pan-Arabism a state policy. Nasser said that he wanted to bring about a new era, one where all manifestations of colonialism would be destroyed. Israel, in his view, was just the latest expression of Western colonialism, a foreign project that the US and European powers had planted in the Middle East to further their own goals. It had no proper place in the region and therefore had to be destroyed. Nasser's desire to eradicate Israel was also likely rooted in anti-Semitism. He frequently spoke of a Jewish conspiracy to control the world, and he contributed to the popularization of the forgery Protocols of the Elders of Zion. With regard to the Holocaust, Nasser wrote that, quote, no person, not even the most simple one, takes seriously the lie of the six million Jews that were murdered. Nasser's government quickly overtook major reforms, such as seizing private property. His rhetoric and policies especially alarmed Great Britain, which had occupied Egypt since 1882 and believed that it had vital interests there which were now at risk. In particular, Britain wanted to maintain control over the Suez Canal, a water passage linking the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea, which it owned jointly with the French. Fun fact, back in the 1800s, a French sculptor designed a huge statue of an Egyptian woman holding up a torch to stand at the mouth of the Suez Canal welcoming visitors. Look familiar? France and Egypt then decided it was too expensive a project, so he pitched it to the US and the New York City souvenir industry was born. So the French also had a stake in the Suez Canal, as well as interests in Egypt's neighbors, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, and others. And did I mention that over two thirds of Europe's oil supply passed through the Suez Canal also? Well, Nasser's pan-Arabism threatened all of this. So where does Israel fit into all this? Well, what's a conflict in the Middle East without the Jews, right? In some ways, pan-Arabism was the counterpart, the Arabs' antidote to Zionism an ideology which promised to unite a people and secure their rights to the land that they deem their own. But it really owes its success to its emotional appeal. If you were an Arab living in the aftermath of the Israeli War of Independence, you were contending with the disaster of displacement, flight, and destruction following the Israeli victory over the Arab armies in 1948 and 49. Later, the Arabs would call this event the Nakba, or the catastrophe. Pan-Arabism seemed to be the answer to the great humiliation they felt, and this helped to make Nasser immensely popular. Israelis in the early 1950s were quite anxious about their nation's security, and with good reason. Not only had the Arabs rejected initiatives to arrive at a peace settlement, but extreme violence continued to hit the Jewish state. Arab terrorists known as Fedayeen infiltrated Israel from Egyptian and Jordanian territories, and in the period from 1949 to 1956, the period leading up to the war, they had executed thousands of infiltrations and attacks and killed hundreds of Israelis. For Israelis, many of whom had survived the horrors of the Holocaust as well as the traumatic War of Independence, this level of violence could not be tolerated. So how did the Israeli government respond to this threat? Well, in 1953, General Moshe Dayan picked Major Ariel Sharon to head an elite commando outfit known as Unit 101. 
which would launch retaliatory strikes across Israel's borders in an effort to deter Fedayeen attacks. Unit 101 is very controversial, but it achieved its goal of suppressing terror attacks against Israeli civilians. To learn more about the topic, check out our video on the Fedayeen at the link below. Okay, back to England and France. So during all this, England, France, and the US had entered into an agreement to limit arms sales to the Middle East in order to maintain a balance of power between the Arabs and the Israelis. So when Nasser wanted to boost his military power and buy more weapons, he turned to the Soviet Union. Now, this was during the height of the Cold War, so the Soviets were quite happy to build an alliance with Egypt to counter the Western democracy's influence in the region. In September 1955, news of a massive weapons deal between the Soviets and Egypt was announced, adding to the worries of the Americans, British, French, and of course, the Israelis, which would culminate the next year in the Sinai War. Okay, there's a lot going on here, so let's take a step back and look at the big picture. Three separate conflicts were taking place in the region in the mid-1950s. The Cold War between the communist world and the Western democracies, the Arab national independence movement struggles against Britain and France, and the Arab-Israeli conflict, which was now focused on Israel and Egypt. Hindsight is 2020, but with so much tension from so many different sides, it may never have been a question of if war would break out, but only when. Oh, and we haven't really mentioned the role of that other country, the one that sometimes makes waves. What's it called? Oh yeah, the United States, but we'll get there. So in 1956, when Nasser announced that Egypt would nationalize or take over the Suez Canal, remember, oil, Britain and France decided to act. Israel also had issues with Nasser's decisions since Egypt was now blocking Israeli goods from passing through the canal and the Straits of Tehran. This economic threat, combined with the arms that Egypt was acquiring from the Soviet Union, combined with the Fatayeen attacks from Egypt, was seen as a real danger for Israel's existence. But what to do? On October 22nd, Prime Minister of Israel David Ben-Gurion, Minister of Defense Shimon Peres, and IDF Chief of Staff General Moshe Dayan secretly traveled to an isolated house in France to meet their French and British counterparts. The French suggested a plan. First, Israel would attack the Egyptian army in the Sinai and pose a threat to the Suez Canal. Britain and France would pretend to be surprised and would then invade Egypt to separate the combatants. In doing so, they would take over the canal and, if things went well, topple Nasser while they were at it. This would enable the two European powers to pretend that they were acting as neutral referees in a dispute to which they had no part. The Israelis did not trust the British, who had been their enemy less than a decade earlier, but the French were not prepared to act without their British allies. So the Israelis, French, and British signed the secret pact. On the afternoon of October 29, 1956, according to the plan, Israeli troops moved into the Sinai Desert. Ariel Sharon led his paratroopers to the Mitla Pass, a key passageway to the Suez Canal. By the next day, the paratroopers captured three Egyptian military bases and were within 30 miles of the canal. As arranged, Britain instructed Egypt and Israel to withdraw all of their forces from the canal. In essence, this meant telling Egypt to give up control. Egypt predictably rejected Britain's demand that on October 31st, British and French planes bombed Egyptian airfields and destroyed Nasser's air force. The same day, Israeli forces pushed into the Gaza Strip to destroy the Fedayeen terrorist infrastructure there. They then turned south and advanced into the Sinai until the town of Sharm el-Sheikh. Within a week, Israel had routed the Egyptian military and taken control of the Straits of Tehran and the eastern Sinai coast. During the campaign, Sharon cemented his reputation as a bit of a maverick. He made some decisions to advance that were beyond the scope of his orders. He directed an attack by his paratroopers against dug-in Egyptian positions at Jibal Khitan without authorization. General Moshe Dayan later praised the move, even as he criticized Sharon for causing more Israeli casualties than necessary. Since neither England nor France chose to land either of their armies in the conflict zone until a week after the combat began, virtually all of the fighting that took place was conveniently between Egypt and Israel. The conflict raged for one week until the United States finally stepped in and told Britain, France, and Israel to back off, and they did. Israel still feared that a pullback might leave the Sinai and Gaza once again available as bases for launching terror attacks into Israel, but the US promised Israel that in return for a rapid and complete withdrawal from those territories, the Americans would guarantee that the waterways would remain open for Israeli shipping. The US also agreed that Israel would be free to use force to defend her rights in the future, a deal that Israel would definitely take them up on a few years later. Several days after the fighting had stopped, reports coming out of Prime Minister Ben-Gurion's office suggested that Israel might annex the Sinai Peninsula. U.S. President Eisenhower was not cool with this idea to say the least. He told Israel in no uncertain terms that such a move would derail relations between their two countries. This might sound strange since the United States nowadays is the greatest supporter of Israel in the international community. But in those early years of the State of Israel, the U.S. adopted a more pragmatic approach to the Middle East so as not to drive the Arabs into the hands of the Soviets. But this didn't really work out so well, and the Soviets ended up as a major supporter of the Arab states anyway. Once the conflict was over, it wasn't just the US that seemed isolated from Israel. Other Western nations, including the British and the French, who were responsible for the entire war plan to begin with, were also unprepared to damage their relations with the Arab world by tolerating an Israeli occupation of Egyptian territory. And the Soviet Union, now Egypt's sponsor, led the demands for a complete Israeli withdrawal. Regardless of the outcome of the campaign, Israel had already gained much from its partnership with Britain and France. Although it was still a young nation, it was finally being taken seriously by the major Western powers and was being supplied with arms from the French. This Israeli-French cooperation continued with the sharing of knowledge on nuclear energy and the secret construction of a nuclear reactor in Demona. Was I not supposed to say that? Within Israel, the reaction to the war's outcome was generally positive. 
We can now understand why Israelis often see the Sinai campaign as their second war of independence. It restored a sense of security to a people that had lived through eight years of infiltrations and constant threats of annihilation. The success and professionalism of Israel's military also became a great source of pride and led to a decade of relative quiet in the region. Well, kind of, but we'll talk about that in another episode.